In a recent paper, scientists showed you can take human cells and convert them to stem cells using chemicals. No genes, no viruses, no RNA, just chemicals. So let's take a look at how they did it, what this means, and if it really is as easy as it seems. So what they were doing in this paper was establishing another mechanism of cellular reprogramming. This is the process of converting mature specialised cells into pluripotent stem cells that have the potential to divide and to turn into other cell types. This reprogramming process is often depicted as cells moving back up through the Waddington landscape, but what studies have shown is that you can divide reprogramming into different stages. In fact, here they've divided it into three phases. Firstly, the initiation phase, where you want to repress the current somatic expression of the differentiated state. Secondly, the maturation phase, where you start to activate some of these pluripotency genes. And then the stabilization phase, where the complete pluripotency program is activated, and as hinted at by the name, it's stable. It, start, it stays as a stem cell. Irrespective of how we define these different phases of potential tasks that need to be done to get to the pluripotent stem cell state, the current landmark way of doing cellular reprogramming is through the overexpression of four proteins, the Yamanaka factors, OCT4, KLF4, SUX2 and CMYK, which, albeit with a relatively low efficiency, is enough information to provide a cell such that it can turn into a stem cell albeit usually with some growth factor containing media too. But the problem with these approaches is that you have to deliver the genes that express these Yamanaka factors. In contrast, using chemicals to reprogram cells overcomes this major limitation. That means you don't have to edit or add any genetic information. No viral factors to deliver genes are required. You just treat cells and culture which are already in a solution with a solution containing these chemicals that enable reprogramming. Reprogramming using small molecules is inexpensive and easy to control in a concentration and time-dependent manner. It also offers standardization and is appropriate for mass-producing cells. But is it really possible? Well, yes, apparently. In fact, publications coming out in 2013 and 2016 have shown pluripotent stem cells can be induced from differentiated cells using small molecules in mouse cells. And in fact, here is a nice little timeline of small molecule reprogramming because I know you're interested. It also showcases where small molecules have been used for direct conversion from one human cell type to another, skipping the pluripotent step. (laughs) Cheeky. But direct reprogramming really deserves its own video. But anyway, this timeline is out of date because induced pluripotent stem cells have now been made with small molecules in human cells as demonstrated in this recent Nature paper. So the question you probably want to know the answer to, well, how did they do it? Well, let's go to the materials and methods section. And because I read it earlier, I extracted the key information and put it into this horrific looking spreadsheet. And so the spreadsheet just shows the different drugs that they added to their cells at different stages. And the first thing to note is that, well, it isn't trivial. And I'm only showing here the additional small molecules that they used, um, as there already are factors that are commonly used in media when doing even genetic cellular reprogramming. And then this is even more complicated when they started with human adult cells instead of the fetal ones. If you really wanted to know the full details, then obviously the full ingredient list can be found in the paper. And I've also omitted the concentrations used, mainly because it's um, meaningless for what I want to say. But what is at first noticeable is that there are these different stages. Not three as I broke down earlier, but here they have four different phases. One, two, three, four. And at these different stages, they're adding different small molecules, although some of them are appearing on all of the stages. And so there are two things you can consider here. Well, there's probably a multitude of things you can consider, but we'll stick with two for now. The first one is, what are these small molecules doing and what does that inform us about the reprogramming process? And in conjunction with that, 
performing single cell RNA sequencing and chromatin accessibility assays to see what types of things are happening in these cells during these stages. One of the reasons that understanding the journey is interesting as well, because we all know it's about the journey, not the destination. But in all seriousness, cellular reprogramming is not that efficient. I mean, just take a look at this table here. Their efficiencies at best are 2.56%. It's pretty not great, really. I want them to be giving me 110%. So I think we can all agree it can do with some improvements. A rational approach would be to better understand what needs to happen in each of these stages to then think, okay, maybe we should add this or do this a bit differently. And then the other informative things is because not all of the cells unfortunately survive the journey. Some of them make an incorrect journey or they go the wrong way. So why do they make the journey? And why does it go wrong? And why am I speaking in so many rhetorical questions? Well, I don't really know the answer to that last question. So I'm going to go back to the chemicals. What are these chemicals doing? Well, a finding that has previously been made is that to encourage a cell to reprogram, you need to inhibit TGF beta signaling and activate Wnt signaling. These are just two different biochemical signaling pathways that, for interest of time, and because it's been a while since I really dig deep into it, we're going to bypass for now. But in this very generalized manner, this helps to turn off genes involved in differentiation and activate genes involved in cell renewal, features that are seen in stem cells. And so if we go back to that table I showed you earlier, we can see that this one compound, beautifully named 616452, is an inhibitor of this TGF beta pathway. And so what you can do is do this reprogramming process by substituting different small molecules and seeing how it affects the efficiency of this reprogramming process. So as I said, to further understand the reprogramming, they also performed single cell RNA sequencing, which is pretty cool, although it's pretty in line with what we sort of expect to happen on addition of these small molecules. There is the initial expression of fibroblast genes, which is the starting cell state, it then goes through this plastic developmental stage and then an extra embryonic stage, which that actually was a little bit surprising to me, before finally reaching this naive pluripotent stage. So this is the successful reprogramming trajectory. And then you can use that successful trajectory to then analyse what happens when it's unsuccessful. And one of the interesting things from the study was the fact that the drug Junkin 8 that um, inhibits junk signaling pathway was very important for the acquisition of this intermediate plasticity signature. The interesting thing about this is that what that RNA sequencing data inferred is that inhibition of this junk signaling pathway prevented pro-inflammatory signaling. And so it suggested that this pro-inflammatory signaling was impairing the generation of plasticity for further reprogramming. So in conclusion, these results demonstrated a chemical synergy of small molecules that manipulates endogenous cell pathways and epigenetic targets, effectively liberating human somatic cells from a tightly locked differentiated state. Possibly the most fun sentence I've said all day. An important aspect of our findings is that small molecules can unlock the restricted human epigenetic landscape to a plastic state through chemical-induced de-differentiation. I have to say that's a close second. So how would this information be applied? It could be developed as small molecule oral drugs, they could be injected intravenously, or it could be applied topically. In fact, one of the components is retinoic acid, which was one of the chemicals used in work from Michael Levin's lab that promoted limb regeneration in frogs. But would this actually ever work in vivo? Well, the next step towards clinical application would involve confirming whether there's a possibility of these drugs inducing tumorigenesis and also determining the proper concentration, combination and treatment times in FIVO. But there is also the possibility of ex FIVO treatment and expansion. So that's chemical induced reprogramming for you. And if you want to learn more about alternative rejuvenative approaches, then you should check out this video here. So with that, I hope you've learned something. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.